Okay, welcome everyone. Um, it is just 501, so we will give um, a couple more minutes or a minute or two for people to come on in, um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started at least with some introductions. And if people want to trickle in between, you know, 502, 503, they can. So give me one second. Let me just stop on our screen. Okay, so we are here at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. Um, my name is Amy. I work here in the admission office um, based on the Worcester campus. I've um, been with MCPHS for a little while now, um, especially man managing in OT admissions. I'm also really happy to introduce my colleague, Tina, which I'll let her introduce herself in just a moment. She is your new contact for occupational therapy. So if you have had anything um, sent from the school, you probably have seen my name on it, um, but this is Tina's introduction. So Tina, I'll let you introduce yourself um, and then Michelle and Laura, if you'd like to make a quick introduction as well. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Tina Hills. I'm the Assistant Director of Admission here at Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, and I am your admission counselor. So I look forward to getting a chance to meet everyone um, with a counselor appointment, um, a call, and look forward to your journey and all things occupational therapy. Professor Dowling? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Michelle Dowling. I have been teaching at MCPHS since 2018. I first started as an adjunct at the Manchester office and then earned my clinical doctorate at the tender age of 50, was able to then pursue the full-time position at the Worcester campus. So I very much enjoyed teaching in Worcester. Um, I live in Southern New Hampshire, so I can kind of make it to either campus um, pretty easily. But I've been a practitioner for 33 years, specialized in hand trauma, um, and I've done mental health. And I am most recently also practicing in low vision, helping friends with vision loss. So that's a little bit about me. Laura? Uh, my name is Laura. I am a second year OT student at the Manchester campus. Um, I'm just here to help give the lowdown tonight um, and share some of my personal experiences with the program so far. Um, I currently live in Manchester, like two blocks away from the campus, um, but I'm originally from Virginia. Excellent. Just to let everyone know um, on the webinar that this will be recorded. It's also going to be available um, through our website and we can send you um, personal recordings of this. So I know sometimes when I'm on webinars, I'm trying to quickly take notes, but I'm also trying to pay attention. Um, but just know that this will be available. So we hope that this will be very informative for you. We do have the open Q&A box. So if anyone has any questions, throughout the webinar, please um, go ahead, pop your questions in there. You may, I may say, you know, we're gonna get to that in two or three slides, hold tight, um, or say that um, may stop the presentation, but we will make sure that all questions are answered and we do have open Q&A at the end um, of our session. So, all right, so with that, we're gonna talk a little bit about occupational therapy and MCPHS. So if you're, here for OT, that means we're in the right realm because we're here to talk about healthcare as well. So at Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, healthcare and health science is, is what we do. Um, so in terms of the healthcare field, it is definitely growing. Um, one thing that always kind of strikes out to me with OT is kind of, you know, our theme about mental health. And when I think about healthcare and society kind of present day today, mental health is the first thing that I think of. Um, so not surprising to me that we're looking at stats of OT job growth through 2033 and much higher than some of these other occupations. Healthcare in general is on the rise. Um, healthcare is now the largest employer in the United States. I myself personally have parents that 
are now a little above the retirement age and dealing with healthcare and questions that I never thought I would have to think about. Um, so I do know and always thankful for healthcare workers, but being in kind of that position really does show just how just how big the field is and just how important it needed and needed in our society it is. So with that, we are a comprehensive healthcare university. We have over 100 programs spanning this area of healthcare. So not only do we have, you know, the clinical sciences, you know, PA and nursing and OT and optometry, and um, we also have PhDs, we have research students, we have biology students, and we have everything really surrounded around health science. From our start over 200 years ago, that really was our plan. We were pharmacy school, obviously in our name to begin with, but really grew from there and really stuck true to what our mission was. You know, you won't find an English degree at MCPHS. You're not going to find, you know, a history research PhD here on the Worcester or Manchester campus in our grad programs, but you are going to find everything centralized around healthcare and health sciences. So we've been around a long time. We've been doing this healthcare thing a very long time. And so we have over 7,000 students that range from all over the world. Um, I've had the pleasure of doing international recruiting for a few years and some places that I was going, I was like, I think I need to look up actually where this is on the map. And lo and behold, someone from MCPHS was there. And this is actually when I wasn't working for MCPHS. So um, even being on the road with other, with other schools and sometimes everywhere I went, Massachusetts College of Pharmacy was either nearby or knew someone from there. So our reputation really does um, hold for itself. Um, and then our clinical affiliations. So really it's an advantage of having, you know, these three different campuses under our university umbrella. We have our Boston campus, which is predominantly undergraduate programs. Um, so with that comes the Longwood Medical Area. So that means that just because our students are not on the Boston campus doesn't mean that they may not have access to some of those locations um, for field work, um, or maybe some other programs with clinical rotations and um, their specialties. We also have Manchester, New Hampshire, which we have the Elliott Hospital right down the street. We've got the Worcester campus, where if you step two steps off the sidewalk, you're at St. Vincent's emergency room door. We have the UMass healthcare system. So being on that network really opens up where our students can go and where our students are gaining this experience. At MCPHS, we are committed to your success. So we are a large university, also with a large amount of resources. I am always surprised about, you know, students and learning more about resources that sometimes I don't even know that we have. Um, so we usually um, are case. Um, so oh, forgive me because I always forget the exact acronym Center of Academic Laura, can you help me out with this one? I also am not great about it, but I think it's Center of Academics, like something about student success, I think. Yes, yes. Student so, success and excellence. Yeah. Excellent, Thank you. there we go. <laughs> Completely just drew a blank, but that's really where our student success services are. Essentially that is where that umbrella is. So in terms of your advising, your peer tutoring, peer mentoring, um, career services, all under that umbrella, and not just, and I think a lot of people think, okay, career services, oh, I get that maybe when I'm an alum or I'm on my way out of the program. Career services is available to you the day that you walk onto the campus. Um, so having all of these resources in play and being introduced to them during orientation, during that first two weeks of classes, knowing that you have this help nearby, I think is really essential um, to our students. These programs are, they're not, you know, they're not necessarily easy. This is hard work to put into that. And we know that, and we know that you need that backup, that support, and not just, you're gonna have amazing faculty members um, and advisors, but it's also really important to have those academic coaches and your peers to lean on and having that tutoring and mentoring available. 
Um, the university itself, I would love for everyone to always come and visit to really see what our facilities look like, to come meet our faculty, to come meet our students and really see it live and up close. Um, MCPHS has 748 faculty members. Most of those full-time faculty members hold terminal degrees in their field. Um, and our faculty members come from what they do. So this isn't, you know, faculty sometimes where you see in big universities that, you know, their whole life was academic. Um, our faculty members are coming from their clinical work. They're coming from, um, you know, just the, the outside world as sometimes I like to tell students. They are your first networks. They are your first colleagues when you're going through programs like this. So having state-of-the-art facilities and really strong faculty is something that um, we pride ourselves here at MCPHS. Another great point to point out in we have this benefit because we are a healthcare university, is something called interprofessional education. Um, I'm gonna briefly kind of talk about what this is and I'm gonna let Laura talk a little bit about her experiences so far in it. But this is a collaborative approach to an idea of whole health, whole healthcare. We need to be able to talk to our counterparts and our colleagues of other industries. You know, as an OT, you're going to pick up the phone and more than likely be talking to a PT or talking to an RN or talking to a PA or possibly, you know, we're, when we're talking about low vision, like Professor Dowling was talking about, you're going to be talking with an optometrist and trying to work out different treatment plans with multiple different practitioners. And that's where this comes into play. So you would have um, exercises like case studies or a small book to read. And you come together every quarter at a round table type discussion um, or Zoom presentation, different ways of delivering this. Um, and you come together to really talk about how do we approach this. Myself as an OT, this is how I look at it. You know, counterpart across the table as being the optometrist. Well, this is how they would approach it. In a round table, you discuss on how you would treat the patient um, as a whole. So Laura, I'll let you talk about, especially if you've used any of our success services um, and a little bit about your experience with IPE. Yeah, so I can uh, speak on my experience with IPE events. Um, so I've been offered three, but I've only been able to attend two because I had COVID for the last one. Um, so I can't speak on that one. Um, but the first one I went through um, was we kind of just all had an assignment um, to get to know what all our, all the different disciplines do and how they work together. Um, so we had like a worksheet to fill out um, on our own and then we brought it into that IPE meeting that day. And I think it was roughly average two hours um, for the event. We were put into groups in tables and uh, got to kind of just talk together. Um, like I was mixed with a PA student, a nursing student, one other OT student, um, and can't remember, I think there was one more in there. Um, but I basically got to learn what everyone else does and how everyone can work together uh, to treat a patient. Um, and then the second one was a book club event um, we were all assigned a book about kind of like cultural humility and healthcare. Um, and we read it, came back together for the event that semester, um, and talked about it together and talked about the importance of what we learned from it. Um, third one I did not attend, but it was about the opioid crisis. Um, I believe we all got Narcan certified. Um, and everyone got to come together and talk about that as well. Um, and how every profession, every discipline has a role in treating someone going through that situation, basically. So I've had all positive experiences. Wonderful. One other thing I do like to mention, um, kind of this point in the presentation, um, is clubs and organizations. And the reason why I love to bring this up most importantly on the occupational therapy presentation is because I believe that their club has the best Instagram footage that MCPHS has to offer. And I'm always in awe of the different activities they're doing. Sometimes I learn more of just subscribing there for me to go out and tell new students what they're doing. Um, Laura, can you talk a little bit about a um, little bit about that? And I will go ahead and put some handles um, in the chat for everyone if you'd like to join. Yeah, 
Um, so I'm a part of both clubs that um, the OT cohort offers. So SOTA, um, Student Occupational Therapy Association, and then CODA, which is um, Coalition of, oh gosh, I can't remember the acronym. <laughs> it's about <laughs> BEI, basically. Go ahead, Tina. Co Co Coalition of Occupational Therapist Advocates for Diversity. So it's a, it's, a, it's a long one. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, but I attend meetings for both. Um, both of them have different goals. So SODA is just about being an oc occupational therapy student, basically. Um, we get to come together, do events, um, talk about goals for the semester. Um, I believe last semester they did, some events were a 5K, um, typically like raising awareness for certain conditions or certain causes. Um, I know that I believe they've done stuff with families in transition too, like gathering supplies for them, um, backpacks and such. Um, COTAD, um, also very similar, all OT students, but the focus is on diversity um, and what we can do as a club to help promote diversity within the field or within the world. Um, so I personally very much enjoy both. The meetings are um, like once every month, I wanna say once or twice a month. Um, there are club requirements, but those are details that you can get to. Um, so yeah, yeah. Great. Um, and also, since this is, I think, the kind of the glory of having a grad-only campus is we also have student government that many students are involved in. There's also every type of professional organization club you can think of on the MCPHS campus. Um, there's tons of hobby clubs on campus. So lots of different things to do, especially not always academic related, right? We need we need breaks. Um, I know that the outdoors club in Man on the Manchester campus is very active. Uh, which I would expect um, up there in Manchester. So um, always lots of things to do. And, and the glory of this program is there really is time to do them and to be able to get involved and still stay on track um, with school. So that's great. Um, okay, so we've talked about both Manchester and Worcester. Our occupational therapy program is offered on both. Um, so your new home could be MCPHS Manchester. Um, it's the largest city in New Hampshire. Um, we're located right downtown. So right downtown Manchester, you are steps away from lots to do. I always love the fact that it's only two blocks and I can get some really good food when I'm going to visit the Manchester campus because that's my thing. I really love to try different stuff. Um, and I remember going up there for the first time and I was just kind of amazed and I'm like, good. So every time I come up here, I can try something different. And the good part about that is I can still walk to all of these places um, from campus. So it's a year, I mean, year round professional healthcare community. Um, you're also surrounded by other schools. So it's not just MCPHS that's there in the downtown area. Um, we have Southern New England University and the University of New Hampshire right near us downtown. So there's also lots of things to do for kind of college age students, um, you know, different depending on, you know, nighttime entertainment or different restaurants or bars or like open mic nights or kind of those general types of college things all really accessible in the Manchester area. Um, and we have about over 15 student groups um, and organizations. I do live in Worcester, even though I do have the privilege of visiting Manchester. Um, but Laura, would you like to talk a little bit about maybe what you love about Manchester and maybe your favorite activity? Yeah. Um, so or like restaurant I said, or whatever. Yeah, sure. So like I said, I um, am originally from Virginia, but I moved up here um, for undergrad and then eventually for MCPHS. Um, I moved specifically to Manchester. Um, and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, very similar to what you said, uh, there's always plenty to eat. There are like five new places down on Elm Street right now <laughs> um, for dinner or lunch or whatever. Um, personally, my favorite activity is hiking. There's plenty of hiking nearby. Um, just anything to get outside. There's, if you go 30 minutes 
north even like there's plenty to do um outdoor wise um also like you said plenty of young people things to do um so I think that's really convenient and I live two blocks away from Elm Street so I'm like right there everything's walkable um there's always an event going on so I never feel bored basically um yeah I think it's a very cute little city it is I do I like visiting Manchester yeah um and like Laura said she lives about two blocks from Elm Street um the Manchester campus does not have on-campus housing um but there are lots and lots of options within walking distance of campus and we're always happy to help especially you know Laura you were coming from Virginia trying to look for a place to live if any students were coming from afar call the admission office um you know we live around here we have people that you know if you wanted I always tell even students in Worcester sometimes I'm like if you know you want to just send me what street that listing was on I don't mind necessarily like taking a look at that neighborhood for you um I had a student a while back that was coming from Utah and was so scared she had never been to the east coast she found what she thought was a really great deal on an apartment and I had to break it to her that I think it was a scam so got her in a very safe housing um um situation but we're always happy to help with those things especially if you're not from the area so a little bit about Worcester. So this is a picture of the Worcester campus. And if I could count exactly, is it the fourth window up from the bottom would be the OT floor. Um, so your program is right there in that picture. Um, Worcester is the second largest city in New England. We have 12 colleges and universities within our city limits and surrounding areas. So kind of like Manchester, but just a little bit bigger. Well, I like to say kind of, you know, we have a couple of colleges in Manchester while we have over 12 here in Worcester. So just a little bit of a larger scale. Um, we have a really diverse um, clinical area. And so lots of different clinical opportunities for you really close to campus. Um, when I'm, I have the privilege of remembering what Worcester looked like before MCPHS came to town. Um, and all I ever tell people is, wow, because downtown really doesn't even look the same to me anymore. Um, the money that was put into this university has really, truly made a difference. In the city of Worcester, it's changed the look of downtown. Um, we have three different community clinics based on our campus. Um, so we are offering services of either no charge or sliding scale to our community. Um, so lots of going on in terms of the community and really trying to help. Um, like Manchester, it's a year round professional healthcare focused. We have schools around us. We have different hospitals around us. Lots of opportunities um, for field work and about over 30 student groups and organizations on the Worcester campus. But again, it's pretty comparable. The Worcester campus just has a few more programs and just a little bit larger when we're gonna talk about real estate. Um, Michelle, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna go back to the whole food thing is my favorite thing about Worcester and that I pretty much can get anything delivered to me, like including my dry cleaning gets delivered once a week on Wednesdays. Um, but I have a car in my driveway and I don't feel like I'm in too much of a stuffy city, but I would say that that's my, when I think about Worcester, those are the things that I treasure. <laughs> Michelle, do you have anything that you would say that you, you love about the city? I would just agree with you that the revitalization process that MCPHS has put forth for this city has really had the greater Worcester community um, in its mind um, to foster a very uh, welcoming environment for our students and a very safe environment with lots of great food. I have not had my dry clean brought to me, but um, <laughs> it's it's a pretty beautiful area. My brothers used to go to college years ago and the changes are remarkable. Yeah. Um, but yes, lots of lots of good food here in Worcester is, is really my favorite thing. Um, so we've talked a lot about MCPHS in general. We talked about where we're located and kind of all the goodies that go along with that. Now we're really going to talk about occupational therapy. I am going to give a very brief description of this slide, and then we are going to get down into the details about a lot of the things that are here. But in a snapshot, we start every fall. So we just welcomed our new class here to campus. Um, we're in 
we're in week two now of classes, week three. Go, yeah. Okay. So we're still going strong, which is great. Program in general, you'll be here for 24 months and that's year round. So we do go through the summer semester, but please don't fear because you get a break in between every semester. You get all the general Monday, you know, bank holidays off. We get pretty much a full week for Thanksgiving for students. You do get a month, uh, excuse, a month, uh, sorry, a week in March for spring break. And then a week to two weeks in between each semester with that three week winter break um, in the winter semester. I do say that, that the, when you're in your field work stage, that could change in terms of maybe you only get a week and a half off instead of two weeks, depending on when that field work date um, starts. So I always like to give a caveat that it could, you know, subject to change there, um, but in good ways because you're doing things you love. Um, you get your field work right away. So when you get here to campus, we not only are teaching you right away, but we really want you to get involved right away. So you will be doing level one field work um, in mental health, rehab, and pediatrics. And then your level two field work will be in adult and pediatric rotations. But we are, I promise, we've got lots of information on the next few slides on that. Um, and we do, it's a classes of 45. So it's 45 students every fall in Worcester and 45 students every fall in Manchester. Um, and you'll notice that a lot of the things that we try to talk about throughout the presentation is really that return on investment and why MCPHS and why our program is going to be valuable to you. Um, one of the things here that we can talk about is OT in general is looking at kind of that annual wage, um, the Bureau of Statistics. So even though we do understand, you know, education is pricey, we also can show you things of where our students are going and that they really are getting that return on investment after the sticker shock sometimes of higher ed, which I remember when I was going back to grad school having that moment, um, but I would never change a thing about that. Um, but in a snapshot, that's that's our program. It's the 24 month program. It is accelerated and we do not have a spring start. We only have a fall start. So with that, what makes our program unique? I'm going to stop talking for a few minutes and I'm going to let Professor Dowling take over and talk a little bit more about us and, um, and our program. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. So here at MCPHS, we have several themes and that are threaded throughout our curriculum that makes this program very unique from other universities. The first one being our attention to mental health and wellness. Um, you may not be aware of this, but OT originally began its roots in mental health. Back in World War II, when we helped our soldiers return and get back into meaningful activities. So we've moved away from that over the past few years, but now it's time that we're moving back to our roots for mental health, especially in a medical model world. Um, and so recently our profession as a whole through our states and our national um, legislation has put more emphasis on looking at mental health again in the curriculum. So in this newer program, um, we are able to incorporate a much more um, focused area on mental health. And you'll see this as you move through each and every curriculum level. You'll notice the em emphasis on mental health and well-being is woven throughout all of our classes. Um, including several of mine. I do a lot of clinical classes, but I also teach evidence-based practice, which is the next special kind of component to our program. We really focus on research and scholarship. We feel strongly that evidence-based practice is what gives us um, and our stakeholders find meaning for our profession. And so for this reason, the research courses are offered at each semester, starting with mine throughout that didactic portion of the program. And this gives the students the opportunities to learn how to incorporate research into their level two field work and beyond as practitioners. Um, outside of the classroom, we host the NHOTA um, program, the New Hampshire Occupational Therapy Association. I am the New Hampshire state rep for our American Occupational Therapy Association. And we do lots of conferences. I've also attended the Massachusetts MAOTA conference. And our students that go and are invited to go with us and experience the research that's being conducted through these ex these um, conferences. Um, I'm just curious if Laura, have you done, or have you been involved in any of the research projects or have attended anything at the NHOTA level? 
Um, not on the NHOTA level, um, but I do know one of my classmates, um, his name is Josh. He attended, I think actually he attended the national AOTA conference yep. last year. Um, but I haven't had a chance to do anything with the New Hampshire, um, organization yet, um, or research, but that's not to say that past cohorts have not done that. Um, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And past cohorts have done research. And what we're teaching our students is that being a clinician in everyday life is doing research. So hopefully some of our students will know that they're invited to have a seat at the table at the NHOTA conference and they can attend for free. Um, that is something that our state president puts forth as a meaningful opportunity for participation in those conferences. Another thing that MCPHS is known for is our model as the clinic as classroom, classroom as clinic. And this is important because the moment you step foot in our classroom, we begin to speak about what that clinic experience would be like, what you can expect, our lived experiences. As Amy said, we were all clinicians or are clinicians. I still practice even though I'm teaching because my practice informs my teaching. So you'll not only learn about this model, but you'll be able to understand how other clinics run and you will mirror those clinic experiences. The adult labs are equipped with full kitchens, bathrooms, tons of equipment. And we also have pediatric labs that are loaded with lots of sensory equipment and toys and games because what do children do? They have the occupation of play and that is how they grow. Um, so we support that learning experience with these beautiful labs. Um, we also incorporate technology. Um, I like to say I'm OT, not IT. Well, not anymore. We incorporate a lot of tech high tech into our curriculum, including virtual reality, the BNS. And I even got a gentleman who uses the BNS on a regular basis with his diagnosis of CVA to show our entire class how that actually worked. So there's that clinic to classroom experiences. Classrooms are very engaging. Um, with interaction throughout each course that you're taking. And the time is filled with smaller and larger group activities and discussions. We do co Kahoot games. Um, I like to run a Jeopardy game. And that can get pretty wild as we learn about important concepts through a little bit of that fun learning experience. So it's um, very rare that a professor would be just standing in front of you and lecturing for the full duration. We believe in immersing you into that learning experience. Faculties are leaders. So as I said, I am the representative for the state of New Hampshire for AOTA. Um, and faculty through their leaderships are involved in research. And our director takes this really seriously because he is passionate about conducting research and using virtual reality in the rehab setting to actually see and understand mindfulness. So the leadership through research with some of these important topics are being done every day. Some of our faculty are working with optometrists um, to conduct research with low vision. That would be yours truly. And we have faculty who are doing a lot of great work with children's hospitals and the mental health initiative. Um, we just attended the 2024, uh, 2023 um, conference in Kansas City. I was able to present at that and many of our faculty also went to that. And we are looking forward to presenting our research and our leadership skills to those national conferences. And one of our faculty, I believe um, Laura has Dr. Romero, who is the NHOTA president um, and does an amazing amount of work with legislation and advocacy. So we have some pretty amazing um, faculty that our students can hang out with and learn from. And then finally, we do community connections and fieldwork prep. So what also makes our program unique is our community connections. We have great relationships with our surrounding communities. So this means that students have a lot of opportunities for hands-on learning. And we have sites in Manchester and Worcester where we can really help our students experience outstanding level one fieldwork rotations based on those relationships we've developed. And lastly, those community connections really help our students become prepared for level twos, where they go out into rotations and they are working with other clinicians throughout the nation as our students learn how to become clinicians during their level two experience. 
So as students are learning skills in the classroom, they are developing these opportunities um, to learn about observations and then apply that to practice with their skills in field work. Um, that's a little bit of a nutshell of what occupational therapy is like at MCPHS. Hope if I can if I can move my mouse correctly. Um, so with all of that, now how do we get you to those yep. places? How do we get you to being an OT? So that's where um, Professor Darling's going to break down a little bit about the curriculum um, and how it flows. Um, and Laura, we have a couple um, questions for you and kind of just about your experiences so far um, in the classes you've taken. Um, so Professor Dowling, I'll let you kind of start there. Sure thing, thank you for the slide. So we start with the first semester um, of the curriculum and that begins right away with the mental health um, construct. And again, we will see this thread throughout our program, mental health and wellness will be threaded throughout, but we start and launch the program with that. And in our second semester, we're focusing ma mainly on physical disabilities and rehabilitation. We learn about adaptive equipment, assistive devices, and certainly technology, and how to conduct evaluations and write plans of care and provide interventions for individuals with physical and sensory motor impairments. In our third semester, we're now pulling in neuroscience and adult rehabilitation, including upper extremity injuries and stroke, spinal cord injuries. In fact, both campuses actually bring forth um, those who have survived spinal cord injuries and we are able to meet with these individuals and learn about their lived experiences. Within the fourth, sem fourth semester um, is when you're beginning to really delve into the pediatric courses. And you'll also have some specialty courses in cognition and vision throughout that program. In the fifth and sixth semester, these are where your level two field work rotations occur. So the first four semesters are didactic, fifth and sixth become the field work rotations. And I do wanna point out that during your field work, you will also be taking online courses, which are really geared towards helping you transition out of the student role and into that professional role. These courses focus on things like organizing the documentation needed to register for the boards and obtaining licensure, building your resume and joining and supporting OT organizations. So you'll also notice level one and level two field works, um, which are indicated by those stars. Um, the purpose of level one is really to introduce you to different practice settings and that they occur in conjunction with your didactic courses. So while you're learning in our classrooms, you're doing your level ones and you're really seeing this information come together. It might be a full two week experience or it might be once a week depending on that placement. And that would go 15 weeks throughout the semester. The level one fieldwork rotations don't have to have a ton of hands-on, it's mostly observation of clients. And that will really be the hands-on that you'll get for your level twos. But here's a great opportunity in level ones to really build those observation skills and those critical thinking skills. You might be leading some groups and you might be supervising some sessions, but that you're still getting your feet wet. On level twos, these are your 12 week experiences, working full time, following the schedule of your supervisor and then creating and having your own schedule with your supervisor observing you. Um, that This may vary dependent on the setting. So you might have four 10 hour days, five eight hour days. Sometimes it might include a weekend or an evening depending on the practice setting and who the population is that you're serving. You will have one rotation which will be in pediatrics and the other will be working in an adult setting. And this is what you will find across the schools because it is mandated by the ACOTE, which is our accrediting body. And the, they tell us what we must deliver and provide to you as students. So we have flexibility in terms of the location of your level two settings, and many students stay in New England. But some students also go to locations further away if there's family or people that can help support them. Some students are doing their level twos in California, Texas, Florida, because they wanted to be closer to family and friends. So our fieldwork coordinators will be helping you establish that need um, during the level two fieldwork preparation process. And I think we just, um, I think we're sending a student back home to Utah soon. Yes, so, yes. Um, which was incredible. So we're going to have, we're 
we're we're stretching our way out. So I always talk to students sometimes too, like, do you have a cousin in Florida when it's like chilly up here? Maybe you can go stay with them and do some of your field work. So there's always lots of options there. Um, Laura, one question I do have for you. Um, when you were coming in semester one, you're coming in as a new student, how would you say the first semester went in your ease into the program? Um, that maybe some people out here in the audience may be a little nervous of starting OT school, but kind of how was that transition for you? Yeah, so um, before starting school here, starting this program, I worked for a year um, after undergrad, so I took a little gap year. Um, that was just my personal choice. Um, felt like a good choice. Um, and I feel like I came into this program in a better spot than I would have been personally. Um, and I felt really supported by faculty and like second year students. Um, yeah, I, it, it honestly, I don't have anything to ba bad to say <laughs> about the transition. It was all very positive. Um, felt well prepared. Everyone was really nice. Um, they, uh, the how was your schedule the first year versus now you're going into your second year? Um, if I remember correctly, first semester, I think we had Mondays off. Um, and then it was classes Tuesday through Friday. And then after that, since then, it's been Monday through Thursday classes and Fridays off, um, which I've really enjoyed um, having that one day off a week, no matter if it was at the beginning or end. Um, my field work was manageable for a semester, most definitely. Um, that first one you do as a group. So that definitely helped, I think, with some stress levels and just like adjusting, figuring things out, how things work. Um, and since then, still I've, I did my level one adult field work um, this past summer at CMC. And even that was, I really enjoyed it and I have nothing bad to say about it. <laughs> um, can, you, yeah. can you talk to us a little bit about how you, um, the process of picking field work or your preferences for field work? Um, I know since you're gonna be going out into those level two, field works, um, how does that process work? Yeah, so they kind of put us into like a lottery system basically. Um, so the school has its affiliations, um, all the clinics and hospitals and everything, schools that they um, can send students to, those clinics and hospitals have said, yes, we will take a student. Um, and all of those places get put into a system in the computer um, that you will eventually register for. And you get to look through them and pick like your top five. Um, and then it's a lottery system. So just because you pick one place uh, as your first choice, that doesn't automatically mean you're gonna get it. But honestly, I've been through three placements now um, and I've only gotten pushed to the second round once. Um, so most people get placed on their first round. Great. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about the curriculum. We've talked a lot about MCPHS. What do we do as OTs um, or what you will all be doing as OTs? I'm not an OT. Um, but and we talked a lot about that ROI. So our students go through the program. They get this great curriculum. They have these awesome field work opportunities. Well, then what happens? So um, we're very open with these statistics. We're very proud of our students. So graduation rates are almost nearly perfect. So our students are graduating from the program. They are going to take their boards. They're passing their boards. Um, they're getting jobs. So we have employment rates up there. We also have an employer satisfaction survey, which has come back with a 100% satisfaction rate. So, um, you know, our students are going through the program. They're enjoying the program. They're able to graduate. They're prepared to take their boards with our curriculum and our resources to help them. They're going out there, they're getting employed, and they're also providing, um, you know, their employers with great service. So our employers are really happy to have them. Our field work um, employers are very happy to have our students. Um, but Professor Dallin, can you talk a little bit about um, with these employment rates, what some of our students are doing out in the field? 
Absolutely. We're finding that um, after graduation, many of the students are typically having to work in inpatient and outpatient hospital settings. Um, some are choosing actually school systems and uh, there's home health and community based programs. As the field of OT continues to grow and OTs find themselves getting involved in many different non-traditional areas of practice, such as driving rehabilitation or ergonomics and home and community redesign um, and outdoor hippotherapy and development of robotics and virtual reality, we're starting to see the landscape really open up and grow as to what our students are doing. Excellent. So the field is growing, the technology is growing, and the opportunities are growing for our OTs, which we love to see. So now on to the good stuff. How are we going to get here to the program? So a little bit about what we're looking at um, in terms of process and application requirements. Uh, we are rolling admissions. So the, quick, the quicker you're getting in your application and we receive it, the quicker we are sending out decisions. All applications go through OTCAS. So sometimes I get phone calls of, I clicked the apply button, but now it's taking me to a different vendor. That is correct. That is how it's supposed to work. Um, so we use the CAS system. You send in all of your documents. They have a really great like step-by-step -step form. You can save it. You can come back to it as you're adding things. They'll collect um, your official transcripts. So they have instructions on how to request those to have them sent in. There's a section on how um, uploading your personal statement in a copy of your resume. <clears throat> There's also specialized links that you send out to your references that they um, send those back to OTCAS. OTCAS verifies everything for us. So if you attended Harvard um, and you know in a biomedical engineering degree, well, I need to see that transcript verified from Harvard that you took that degree. That's really what they're doing. And they're just kind of doing a little bit of that prep work for us. So when it is complete, when it is verified, it does come to MCPHS. Um, we are looking for a minimum overall and prereq GPA of a 3.0 or higher. Um, if your GPA falls below a 3.0, I do encourage you to reach out to us through your admission. You'd be reaching out to Tina and then setting up an appointment with her to kind of discuss where you are in that GPA, kind of look at your patterns, we do take a holistic approach to applications. So we would want to meet with you just to um, see what happened there and kind of advise you. Yes, we recommend maybe applying now or have some advice on what you can do to apply in the future. So those counselor appointments can be really helpful for us to look over your transcripts um, and just kind of give you that one-on-one -on -one advice. So applications, like I said, are open now. Right now, the deadline is March 1st. Um, so cycles in the past we were able to extend that deadline we never know if we get the permission to do so um so i always suggest if, especially if you're ready now in the fall semester um get it in and get it um reviewed so less work on your part we do not require the gre um, and we also do not have a required interview portion of the process so when you send in your application and the admissions committee does a full review your final admissions decision goes out at that point it's usually within two weeks of us receiving your application. Um, if you have applied already, we are starting to review applications hopefully next week. Um, so we just we just got our new class in, up and running. They are rolling. So now it's time to, um, you know, pedal to the metal. And now we're going to work on the next fall 2025. So um, if you do have an application sitting out there, you should be hearing from us very soon because we're starting the process now. Um, so prerequisites. So that was part of kind of the admission requirements we were just talking about. We do have a couple courses that do need to be completed prior to the start of the program if you're admitted. So if you have two to maximum three, I'm a little lenient on that, prereqs in progress, then you could be ready to apply. Um, they do, we do, we will ask for your plan on when you're going to complete them. So if you're applying here in the fall semester and you're taking statistics your spring semester, we should see on your transcripts that you're registered for spring or you can make a mark of that and that's not a problem. So that's probably one of the top questions I get is I'm finishing that last two prereqs, can I still apply? And yes, absolutely you can. You can be admitted with these prerequisites in progress 
just knowing that it is going to be required that we see the course completed before coming in for orientation. From what I'm understanding, the prereqs really need to be done by August 1st so that we have time um, before you start and you have enough time to get us your information, so. Um, so that's just a few weeks before orientation. So you'll get all of that in a checklist. You'll start to get emails saying you have 10 days, you have seven days, you have five days down to the deadline. Um, but prerequisites, um, A&P one and two with lab, abnormal psychology for lifespan development, it can be adult, adolescent, child, or lifespan development. So there are some options there um, in terms of that. We do require nine credits um, of social sciences. So that would pretty much be the equivalent of three courses. So any kind of sociology or psychology course. Um, if you're ever questionable, we take some history courses in different areas there. If you're ever questioning whether or not a course would fit the social science requirement, send it on over. We're happy to review them and we can always give you that yes or no, yes, it fits or no, or we can give you a recommendation on how to complete whatever you're missing. And then of course in statistics. Um, also some people, depending on the school that you're attending, a and may be set up a little bit differently. So some schools will have anatomy and physiology one and two. Some schools will have a full year of anatomy with lab and a full year of physiology with lab. That is also okay. Um, so I just know that a lot of times some schools have a, different ways of setting it up. So there are some, there's some wiggle room there if you're ever concerned about that. And we're always happy to look over transcripts ahead of time. So financial aid. So we do process federal aid here at MCPHS. So all domestic students with a valid FAFSA will be considered for federal aid. I always suggest, even if you don't think you're gonna get anything or you don't qualify for anything, Always fill it out. You never know. I've had students that are pleasantly surprised sometimes of what options may be out there for them. We do have merit scholarships up to $8,000 per year. Um, those merit scholarships are renewable as long as you are in good academic standing throughout the program. They would be renewed each year you're in the program. Um, and we also always have affordability appointments with student financial services. So if FAFSA is new to you or you haven't taken a look at it in a really long time or have some questions, they did redo some of the form last year. If anyone paid attention to the news, I'm sure someone caught that. So if it's even newer to you because you use the old form, please call us, set up an appointment. Happy to walk you through kind of the basics, what to look for and what options may be available to you with just a couple questions from our financial aid team. So they're wonderful. Any kind of questions like that, please feel free to reach out. Um, and with here, um, Tina, I'm gonna let you go over kind of your contact information and some of the options we have here. Sure. Um, you can see kind of, if you wanna take a screenshot um, or take a picture of my contact information and happy to set up an appointment to kind of go over those prereqs that Amy was just talking about. Um, more information on the program itself. Uh, you could sign up for a tour, get more information um, about us um, on our YouTube channel. And then I know that in a few weeks, we're doing some fall receptions um and that those details will be hopefully on the website in the next week or so we'll be sending out invites so make sure to check out that um we're really excited i'm really excited to kind of go on this journey with you and hopefully can answer all of your questions and if i don't have the answer right away i will certainly reach out to someone that does as i kind of go through this um there's great resources with the uh, university. And I think Amy and Professor Dowling really kind of talked about that. I'm excited. I can see um, that it's such a close-knit community on either campus in Manchester or on Worcester. And um, students and faculty know each other. It, their faculty are incredibly dedicated to making sure that students succeed. And there are stop gaps in place um, if you're struggling or just need a moment. Um, their doors are open, there's office hours. So I feel like there's so many tools in place, um, you know, for students, especially 
in this day and age, and the, it's an incredibly challenging curriculum. So to have those resources makes us, I think, a unique um, opportunity for you to look at occupational therapy at MCPHS because you're going to get that support. Um, it is a smaller community and in the program. So I'm excited. I encourage you all to reach out and hope that we will be chatting soon. The question and answer box is open. I don't see any questions just yet, but I do want to give everyone just a moment um, in case you do have a quick question you want to pop in there. In the meantime, Laura, I'm going to ask you the golden question. Okay. Of, there are lots of OT programs. So yes. do you want to talk a little bit about how you did your search and how you narrowed it down and eventually decided to join us? Yeah, so I was really drawn to this program um, for very various reasons, um, but one of them that Professor Dowling actually kept bringing up is the focus on mental health in this program. Um, at the time, I was really uh, hoping to do a career in mental health. Um, I've found different interests since then um, with school, but uh, that was like what I was looking for. I was like, this is so important. This is like the core of OT. Like, this is what I want my program to teach me. Um, and I really appreciated that there was a field work rotation in mental health. Um, so I really liked that. Um, I liked the area. I loved the fact that it was a two-year program for um, a master's degree compared to a lot of other programs that are three years. So I'm, I believe that's only because three-year programs like take a break in the summer. Um, and I, for me personally, I was like, I feel like I can do this in two. And that is one, cost-effective. Um, and two, just you can get to what you want to do sooner. Um, and I toured a few times, went to a few open houses, um, and gathered information. And I really loved the campus and all the professors were really nice. Um, and it all just seemed overall so manageable. And that's what I wanted. Amazing. Um, yeah. Professor Dowling, I have one question for you. Um, you know, a lot of times um, frequently asked question is you have a master's of occupational therapy you're offering at MCPHS and, you know, school XYZ is offering a doctorate in occupational therapy. Could you talk a little bit about the differences and maybe why you should pick the master's and why our program? Absolutely. So Dr. Doug Simmons, who is in charge of our program, um, definitely looks at what is going on with other schools and he is fully aware of the ACOTA accrediting process. Right now, it is not mandatory for an OTD. Um, that there was a date and now that's been tabled because uh, everyone involved is doing really good due diligence to ascertain what is the rate of return of investment with the OTD versus the master's um, degree. And thus far, uh, we are continuing with the master's program. As Laura said, we're getting our students uh, receiving an outstanding curriculum at a master's degree and getting into the pro uh, out of the program and into the clinic. Um, and they are highly valued um, and being hired left and right with an outstanding 100% graduation um, statistics. So we're doing it right. We are looking at OTD um, down the pike, but we're doing it with intentional and thoughtful um, strategies to make sure our students are going to receive what is necessary and what is appropriate to provide excellent care to the, the clients they serve in the community. So we are keeping an eye on that um, and we are having discussions about that. And we are also very mindful that at this point um, we are supporting M MSOTs um, as they enter into the community. I can also speak on that real fast. Um, that was another decision factor of mine uh, for this program because I also dealt with the dilemma of, oh my gosh, like they're talking about um, doctorate degrees for OT, like what should I do? Um, even though that's not required right now. And um, everyone I talked to, coworkers, uh, professors, other people my age going through the same process as me, they all said, if you, and this, I don't know, Professor Dowling might be able to speak better on this than me, but this is what I've been told that 
if you want to research and teach that a doctorate is the way to go. Um, but otherwise the, like you said, like the compensation um, isn't any different and you're, you're still getting all the same education. So that's why I decided this was my best bet. I want to be a clinician. I want, that's what I want. Absolutely. And I, as a clinician, went back to school to get an advanced degree yeah. and receive yeah. my doctoral degree um, as a post uh, professional clinical doctor. And there are many programs out there. So you are definitely receiving the same income. Um, you're doing the same work. Uh, threads of research are really heavily um, intertwined in an OTD program um, and certainly being an educator of occupational therapy is part of an OTD program. Um, but I, I personally, if it was my child, and I would suggest get out there, get the clinical experience because that is highly valued um, for advancement in our profession as well. Excellent. So I don't see any more questions coming through. So with that, we are just, I think, right at 6.01. So we're doing great on this time. Um, Tina's contact information is there. If you hit contact information for admissions anywhere on our website, whoever you email will get you in touch with the right person. So don't, um, don't worry there. Check out our visit. Check out, um, you know, our YouTube videos. We've got lots of great video content if you're unable to come visit us physically in person. Um, and we look forward to hopefully next year at this time having you sitting in our classrooms. Um, thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Take care. Yay. Thank, thank you. you. I hope I hope that was okay. Oh my god, I thought that was, was great. great. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Oh god, no, it was great. I awesome. totally forgot to talk about housing. I know you 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 touched upon Manchester. You did housing. Yeah. yeah. And, and on the slide in Worcester it says there's it says it, yeah. Housing. So 